time. Never. Never fails us. And he won't. He's a promise-keeping God. We're so glad you're here today. I know many of our friends and brothers and sisters that are a part of this church couldn't make it here this morning because of some of the things that are going on in our community right now and not too far away, just a town over. You know, there's things going on and fires and whatnot. And so I just want to reassure you that uh, we've got our security team that is closely monitoring the situation with the city of Hercules. And if for any danger whatsoever, they'll come and we'll just stop the service and make sure everybody's safe because uh, we want to care for you. God cares for you. And, and so uh, whatever God wants this morning. But he's got the lights on here. I think I hear the air conditioning going. <laughs> And the air is clear here, and so uh, I believe God wants us here for a purpose today, and He wants us to hear a message too. Uh, I'd like to start out with a word of prayer, though, and acknowledge uh, that some of us are here with, with heavy and concerned hearts. I, I've got three pastor friends up in Sonoma County, <clears throat> First Baptist in Windsor, Santa Rosa Bible Church in Rincon Valley in Santa Rosa, and also Christian Family Fellowship in Northwest Santa Rosa and. Uh, those churches, all three of them are in mandatory evacuation areas up there. So they're, they're not meeting this morning. And, and I don't know about you, but if there's danger on my doorstep, my heart is tempted to fear and give way to doubt and concern. And the place that I'd want to be is with God's people, praying and being encouraged. And so they're not able to do that because of the evacuations. And so I think it'd be really appropriate uh, to pray for them. Uh, pray for the hearts of those that aren't with us today. Maybe if you're watching online, we miss you. We wish you could be here. Uh, but we want to acknowledge the fact that our community is, is, is going through some stuff right now. And our brothers and sisters in Christ are, are going through some things too. We want to pray for God's help. Would you join me in prayer? <coughs> Father in heaven, you indeed are Lord of all the earth. Yes, yes, yes. Not PG&E. Not Donald Trump. Not Gavin Newsom. Not Vladimir Putin, not ISIS. You're the King and Lord of all the earth. Hebrews 1 3 says of Jesus, He's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. He upholds the universe by the word of His power. And so, Father, we come before you now with faith in Jesus. This one that can speak into existence the universe. Surely wind and fire and power outages are nothing to him. And so Father we acknowledge our Lord and Savior now. And uh, we want to ask for help. Help for those that couldn't join us here today. Uh, for the city of Crockett, Vallejo, for Odeo, right here in Hercules. For Healdsburg, Windsor, Sonoma County, Santa Rosa, brothers and sisters who came this morning because of evacuations. Father, I pray that uh, any fears and doubts, that you would replace them with hope and confidence in you. Uh, Father, it's easy to say we trust in you when the sun is shining and the grass is green and everything is looking okay. But Father, today we put our trust in you. And we thank you that you're a trustworthy God. <clears throat> and we thank you that you've given us your word, the scriptures that speak of your power and your great glory. And so now as we open the scriptures together, I pray that you would uh, prepare our hearts to receive a message that you wanted Joshua to hear, you wanted the Israelites to hear, and, and what you want followers of Jesus to hear in 2019. So would you open our eyes and ears that we'd behold wonderful things out of your law. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Joshua chapter 3. It's on page 152 if you're going to use the Bible provided there for, for you in the pew in front of you. Page 152, Joshua chapter 3. This is the second sermon, uh, second message, and a series that we started last week called New Territory, Same God. New Territory, Same God. And we're going through the book of Joshua. And we're examining this new territory that Joshua and the people of Israel were entering into. Now, it was too new territory in many ways. 
They were coming into the promised land. That was a journey and a wait of 40 years to get to this point. How many of you have ever just been so excited to go on vacation? And we're talking like, you know, maybe it was going on a cruise or you're going up to the mountains on a ski trip or maybe you're flying to Hawaii or maybe if you're like Larry, you're going to Disneyland or something like that. But you're so excited to go on this trip and you're waiting and you're waiting and the day finally comes. And if you're like me, you throw your stuff into your bag like the night before you leave because I'm a procrastinator. I wait till the last minute. That's because I want all my clothes clean, right? No. Uh, but you throw all your stuff in the bag and you just can't wait to go. Now imagine you're waiting for this promised land. You're waiting to go into this place that God's promised you and your people, but you've been wandering around in a dry wilderness for 40 years waiting for that time. Now here you come and you're on the doorstep. But there's a huge barrier in the way. Well, how did we get here? How did we get to this point? In case you're not up to date on the history of ancient Israel, let me just give you a brief summary. How did we get here? How did the Israelites even get to this point where God made a promise to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob, and they, they lived as a family there in the land of Canaan. And it wasn't theirs. They never owned any land. But God said, I'm going to give you every place where your foot steps down on this land. It's going to be yours someday. And, and it's not going to come today, Abraham or Isaac or Jacob, but it's going to come many days from now. And so uh, Jacob, who was also called Israel, had a big family. There was a famine in the land. Uh, Jacob's sons were a rowdy bunch and they didn't like their brother Joseph so they had sold their brother Joseph into slavery he finds his way down in Egypt well during this famine uh, Jacob's family they're about to starve and according to God's providence God meant all of these terrible things for good and he raises Joseph up so that he's second in command in all the kingdom of Egypt and so he's got a lot of power he's got a lot of resources and by God's wisdom given to him he saves an entire kingdom and so Jacob and his family unbeknownst to them, go down and visit this ruler uh, uh, in Egypt, not knowing that it's Joseph, uh, Jacob's son and their brother. And so uh, there's this emotional embrace. And, and so now they're living in the land of Egypt and they live there for 400 years. But a Pharaoh many, many years later forgets Joseph, forgets Jacob and his family. And instead of treating the Israelites and, and the Hebrews with kindness, they start to make them their slaves. And so they make them their slaves and they're helping to build this kingdom. And the people of Israel begin to multiply greatly. Millions of people probably, but they're slaves to the Egyptians and they start to cry out, Lord, when are you going to fulfill your promise that you made to our ancestors? Set us free. And God heard their cries for help. And so he calls Moses out. Moses is one of the Israelites and he's raised by the Egyptian princess. And so uh, he's raised up and he's sent out and God says, I'm going to deliver my people through you, Moses. He says, me? He goes, yeah. He says, you sure? He goes, yeah, I'm going to save you. I'm going to save my people through you. And so God does that. God sends Moses back and Moses and Aaron lead the people out of Egypt. And you've heard the stories and seen the movies and there's the plagues and the parting of the Red Sea. And, and now they're out and they're delivered. And God says, I'm going to fulfill my promise to you. And right as they're about ready to go in, they send in some spies who come back and bring an evil report. Twelve spies, ten of them say, the land is awesome. Actually, all twelve of them say, the land is awesome. But only two of them say, let's go get it. And 10 of them say it's too difficult. You see, they, the Israelites, they had seen God do amazing things through these plagues in Egypt. They had even seen God part the Red Sea so that they could cross over on dry ground and destroy the Egyptian army. They saw it. They saw God's mighty power, but they said, you're not strong enough, God, to defeat the enemies of Canaan. And so God said, okay, I'm going to make you wander 40 years in the wilderness. An entire generation was wiped out. I mean, this journey wasn't just a journey in a dry desert. I'm sure the funerals were frequent. This wilderness, this, this place that initially seemed like a, a place of deliverance out of Egypt, all of a sudden turned into a place of death a place of judgment. And so now here they are. There's life on the other side in the promised land, but we're still over here and there's death. We can't wait to get out of here. But not only that, not only that, but 
they're getting ready to cross over into this promised land, but, but also the challenge came here. Moses, their leader, has just died. Moses is gone, and now Joshua has been raised up to succeed Moses and to lead this people across the Jordan River. They're on the east side of the river. They want to get over to the west side of the river. They want to get out of the wilderness, which represents death and punishment, and they want to get over into the promised land, which represents God's blessing and his life and his favor. They want to get there. So the story of Joshua is them finally getting into the land. And we're going to see them take their first steps in the promised land here today in Joshua chapter 3. Some some challenges that they faced though is would God continue to be with them as he was with Moses? How could they defeat the Canaanite people who were already entrenched in the land with their fortified cities and their high walls? Would they remain united in completing this mission? Remember, two and a half tribes said, we actually like part of this land over here. We want to stay over here. And it's like, all right, fine, but you've got to cross over with us and you've got to fight these battles. Would they stay united as a nation and as a people devoted to the Lord? And then finally, would, would they be faithful to serve the God who made a covenant with them? God said, I'm going to take you into the land, but I'm making a covenant with you, and you must love me by keeping my commands and my laws. Do not bow down to the gods of the nations you're going to dispossess. Would they remain faithful? But God gives Joshua a promise. We heard it last week. Pastor Larry preached this sermon from Joshua chapter 1. Joshua 1, 9, God tells him, be strong. Be very courageous. Why can you be courageous in the midst of all of this seemingly uh, formidable obstacles? Why? Because I'm with you. Be strong and courageous, for I will be with you, whatever you wherever you go. What a promise. What a promise. But it's just a promise until it actually gets fulfilled and becomes reality. So what we saw is a promise in Joshua chapter 1. We're going to see that promise begin to be fulfilled in Joshua 3. Imagine waiting though. All this waiting. All this waiting and we finally get to the moment. 40 years of waiting and waiting. And here we are on the doorstep of the promised land. Let's take a look at the story. Joshua chapter 3 verse 1. We're going to stop at a couple of parts and just kind of summarize where we're getting at so we can get a grasp of the story, okay? Joshua chapter 3, verse 1. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you've not been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves. Set yourselves apart. Wash your clothes and get ready. For tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Get ready. God's going to do some amazing stuff. Joshua then said to the priest, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel so that they may know that I'm with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and Jebusites. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then... Choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. Let's stop there for a moment. So here's the story now. They're on the cusp of going in. They said, it's been three days now. God's made the promises to us, and we didn't see in uh, Joshua chapter 2, but they had already sent a couple of spies to go over and check out Jericho and come back and report, and now it's time to cross. 
And here they are. Well, who are the characters that we have in this story? First of all, we have the Israelites. Now remember, I already told you, this is the whole generation of Israelites who had heard about, but had never seen the amazing wonders that God did back in Egypt. The plagues and, and the parting of the Red Sea. These are stories to them, but not realities in their own eyes and in their own mind. Then they watched an entire generation of their parents and grandparents who had seen these things perish in the wilderness because that generation would not believe that God could accomplish what he said he would do. So the question for these Israelites, this new generation now is, will God still work for us the way he did for our ancestors? Now, I, I got to hand it to them. So far, they're doing what God told them to do. They're doing what Joshua and the officers said to do. They're getting ready to go. But how would you feel? <laughs> how would you feel getting ready to go over to this land that you've never been to before? You've heard all about, but you know there's a lot of enemies over there. Am I really ready for this? I'm excited. I've been waiting for this day. I certainly don't want to stay here, but I'm not so sure about moving forward. What about Joshua? Joshua was the leader and the successor to Moses who was charged with leading the people into the new land. Now think about him. He's, he said, man, I, I've seen those things. Now Joshua was one of the few people, Joshua and Caleb were a few people that actually did get to see all the awesome stuff that God did in Egypt and at the Red Sea. And now he's got to be wondering, man, I remember that stuff, but there was something that was going on back there that's not true now. What was it? Moses. Moses was here. Moses was the man. He was my mentor. He was the person that I looked up to. He was our leader. So yeah, I saw God do all kinds of awesome stuff for us, but that was back with Moses. Will he really be with me? He gave me a promise a few days ago. Will he come through? Will he come through? There's a true test. Well, who else do we have? We have the priests. Now, the priests, they, they mediated between God and the people of Israel. You see, God's presence was in the midst of Israel at the tabernacle, and specifically at the Ark of the Covenant. And they had to help the people worship God. They, they were there to help be a mediator so that they could worship God with their sacrifices. But they had to uh, provide this buffer between God and the people because His presence had to be treated with the utmost respect and reverence. And God tells, Joshua tells, God tells Joshua to tell the priests, here's what I want you to do. I want you to carry the ark. Now, the ark is, you've seen Indiana Jones, right? Come on. The ark is the box. It's this chest that contained the tablets of the commandments, right? And it had a cover over it, and it was covered with gold. And it had several cherubim laid out over like this. And over that is the representation of God's presence among the people. And whenever they brought it out, when they were moving around, when they broke camp, they would cover it with like one of the curtains so that no one would actually look at it. And it had these rings that you could slide poles in. And so you probably had a priest or, or two at each corner, and they'd carry it together. Here's what God, through Joshua, tells the, people, uh, tells the priest. Here's what I want you to do. We're going to go into the land, and you're gonna, I'm going to go first. So you're going to take me with the ark, and we're going to go in there first. And priest, here's what I want you to do. Go stand in that water. You want me to do what, Lord? Go stand in the water? Should I keep my shoes on? Is it muddy in there? What if a fish nibbles at my foot? I don't know what they're asking, but it's a strange request. Go stand in the water. With the ark, yes, with the ark, go stand in the water. Kind of a strange request. Well, there's one character we've not brought out. It's the Lord of all the earth. You know, it's, this book is titled Joshua, but the, the main character of this book, as with all of the 66 books of the Bible, whether stated or not stated, is the Lord of all the earth. You see, in, in, in chapter 3, verse 11, in chapter 3, verse 13, it, it talks about this ark, that God is going before the people as the priests carry the ark. And it says, see the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Again, in verse 13, uh, the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, of Yahweh, and he's the boss, the king, the creator, the Adonai, the Lord of all the earth. It's his. 
You see, they were about to go over into this land, into Canaan. And Canaan had all kinds of peoples, all kinds of nations there. We saw the Jebusites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Termites, some other ites, right? All kinds of ites there in Canaan. And they all had their gods. They worshipped the gods of their livestock, uh, of, of cattle. They worshipped the god of rain. They worshipped the god of their crops. They had all kinds of gods that they worshipped, just like the Egyptians had in similar ways back in Egypt. And so they're wondering, is Yahweh going to be able to hang with all these other gods in Canaan? I mean, he's kind of outnumbered, right? They all got all these different gods there with their idols and they bow down. Can Yahweh hang with these guys? And it's no mistake that twice we see that it's not just the ark going in. It's not just the ark of Yahweh going in. It's the ark of Yahweh, the God of Israel, the Lord of all the earth that's going ahead of the people. Would the God of Israel have enough power to compete with the Canaanite gods? Does he have enough firepower? Watch what he's about to do. So we get to verse 14. <laughs> it says there in chapter 314 of, of John, uh, excuse me, Joshua. You're going to start turning all over the place. Joshua 314. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during the harvest. Time out, time out. We get another commentary here on what's going on. So not only are they going into this foreign land, not only are they leaving the place of death and going to the land of promise, not only are they being led by God, the Lord of all the earth, but now they've got to cross this great barrier. Now the Jordan River is called the descender. That's what the Jordan River means. It's the great descender. It comes from the roots of, of Mount Hermon way up in the north, north of the Sea of Galilee in the land of Israel. Okay, And it has some roots there with several streams that flow into a lake. And then it comes out of that lake down to the Lake of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, excuse me. And then it comes from the Sea of Galilee and it flows down to the Dead Sea where it stops. Where it starts is about 10 feet above sea level at Lake Hula, Hule or something. And then it comes down and it trickles down, not trickles, it rushes down 1,300 feet below sea level. It's the lowest place on the earth there at the Dead Sea. And at this time, we're getting commentary here that tells us about this great descender river. Not only that, but it's also that flood stage. You see, their, their uh, climate's a lot like ours. Our wet time of year is in the late winter and the early spring. So after all these spring rains come down from the mountains and flash flood the wadis, and they all flow from the east and the west, and they come into the Jordan River, and it's coming down from the mountains in the north. You get the picture here. This time of year, Year, it's a great descender and it's a huge rushing river and it's flooded out it's probably a mile wide at this point at this time of year and now you're getting an understanding of the priest saying you want me to do what stick my feet in there is this too difficult for God you know two spies in chapter 2 perhaps they could get across the fords of the Jordan way up north from where they were and they did, but they were probably very strong men that were able to get across and go over and spy out. But we're talking about an entire nation of people crossing at this part of the river through the flood down this great descender. I've actually whitewater rafted in the Jordan River. Isn't that cool? That's pretty cool. I had a lot of fun. It was very scary too. <laughs> I wouldn't have wanted to cross it like that. But, but this Jordan River is rushing and flowing. Think about all the animals they had. Think about the, the children that they had. No way they're getting across this river. And the Canaanites loved it. They loved it because they knew, hey, we got all the time we need right now. They're standing on the west side of the Jordan. Nah, 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 nah. You can't get to us. This barrier is protecting us. We get to verses 15 to 17. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during the harvest. Yet as soon as the priests, yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge. Now I imagine it's probably kind of cold and ooh, ah, ooh, that's cold, right? 
But once they get their feet in, look at what happens. Once their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of the Arava, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood, not in muddy water, on dry ground, while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Think about the questions. Can our God compete with the gods of Canaan? Would God really be with Joshua with the way he was with Moses? Would God really be with the people of Israel like he was with their ancestors in Egypt and, and in their deliverance there in the crossing of the Red Sea? Is God really with us like he is with them? Is our God strong enough? And God is just kind of say, hey, you got any more questions for me? Definitive, decisive. He showed off his power. Joshua uh, uh, was promised by the Lord. The Lord said, uh, he said, I'm going to do amazing things. And so back in chapter 3, verse 5, he says, Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do amazing things among you. Here it is right here. The priests stick their feet in the water. And once the priests get in, that barrier is just completely dissolved. And the waters are being piled up miraculously in the north so that it's dry ground all the way to the Dead Sea and they can cross over. An entire nation. You got any more questions for me? Any other challenges for me? You see, these words, amazing things that God did in the sight of Israel and for Joshua, it's the same word back in Exodus 3. When God appeared to Moses, he said, Moses, I'm going to send you to Egypt and guess what I'm going to do? Amazing things through you in Egypt to deliver my people. It's the same word, the same kind of power that God was showing off to Egypt. He was now showing off to the Canaanite peoples to see our God is the Lord of all the earth. Amen. Yahweh, the God of Israel, proved once again that he is the reigning, defending, undisputed Lord of all the earth. He's awesome. By entering the river before the people, God was showing that he was bef going before them into the land and that they could follow him to face any challenger. Bring them on, God saying. I'm going before you. Make sure you're behind me, Israel. Joshua, come on behind me. I'm going in first and I'm going to take everybody on. You don't have anything to fear. Our Lord is the Lord of all the earth. So the display was unmistakable. There's no challenger. God was showing by this decisive act to say, remember what I did at the Red Sea? You ain't seen nothing yet. Watch this. Whew. Let's go take the land. Let's go take the land. But you see, that's, that's not the problem of the story. The problem of the, of the story isn't God's power. Can he really come through for Joshua? Could he really come through for the Israelites? Is he really the Lord of all the earth or does he have to compete with the Canaanite gods? That's not an issue. The issue is with the people. The issue is, you see, they saw this exact same miracle happen at the Red Sea, but do you know what happened? A few days later, they forgot. They forgot God's power. They forgot God's ability to redeem his people no matter the obstacle. And a few days later, they started to grumble and complain and say, we're going to starve out here. And a few weeks after that, they were bowing down to a golden calf and forgetting the God that delivered them out of Egypt. So the issue is not that isn't, is God able. The issue is will we remember God's power and his presence with his people? Let's read chapter 4. And I'm going to take just some sections here. We won't read the entire chapter for the sake of time. But let's begin in chapter 4, verse 1. Now, when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you, and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, 
one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took the 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, as the, as the Lord had told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to their camp, where they put them down. Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan, the spot where this priest had, who had carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. So Joshua, the book of Joshua, was written sometime after all of these events, probably during the time of the judges. And as the writer's writing, it says, those stones are still there to this day. You can go see them and remember the great power of the Lord. And so uh, we see uh, verses 10 through, through 13 that all the people had passed over and they'd done what the Lord had asked. And verse 14 says, the de That day the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in awe of him all the days of his life, just as they stood in awe of Moses. But friends, you've got to understand something. It wasn't the man. It was God. It wasn't the man. It was God. Can I, can I stop for a moment here? We just celebrated a man that God used as an instrument for this church for 48 years. Praise be to God. And we don't know exactly what the future holds. We don't know who the next lead pastor will be and what the challenges will be that come ahead. But we believe that it's not about the man. It's about God. It's about God. We're in new territory, but we've got the same God. Joshua is realizing this. The people of Israel are realizing this. Verse 15, Then the Lord said to Joshua, Command the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priest, Come up out of the Jordan. And the priest came up out of the river carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And no sooner had they set their feet on the dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran at flood stage as before. Just in case you thought it was a coincidence, it's going right back to where it was. Israel was on the east side before. Now they're on the west side flooded river, and I'm sure the Canaanites are going, what in the world just happened? <laughs> Verse 19, on the tenth day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones that had, had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them this. Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he had dried it up before us until we had crossed over. But here's the reason why you need stones. Verse 24, he did this so that all the peoples of the earth of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful. And so that you might always feel fear Yahweh, the Lord, your God. Now listen to what happened to the, the Canaanites. Verse 1 of chapter 5. Now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until they had crossed over their hearts melted in fear and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. Friends, I don't know what kind of enemy you feel like you're facing today, but because we trust in the Lord of all the earth, your enemy's hearts can melt before you today. We trust in the Lord of all the earth and that's what happened to the hearts of the enemies of the people of Israel. Verse 24 though. Verse 24 gives us I love statements like this because it helps us understand why is this story here? Verse 24 says again, he did this. He did this. He parted the, the Jordan River for you Israelites. God did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Are you one of the people of all the earth? 
I think you are, unless you came from another planet. <laughs> I am. This story is here for us, the people of all the earth, so that we might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful. And so that God's people would fear and honor and respect and obey and love the Lord. See, here's the point. Here's the point of this story. In stopping the Jordan River so they could cross, God was providing Joshua and the Israelites with the, the decisive act of his presence and power for them. He was removing all the doubt that he would fulfill his promises to them despite the challenges they were about to face. You see, the challenges are going to get serious here in the book of Joshua. It wasn't like, all right, let's have a parade. The victory's won. No, the battle hadn't even started yet. But he wanted to give them an act so that they would know every time they came up to a Girgashite city, I don't know if we could take this. And they would look at each other, remember the stones, remember God's power at the Jordan, and then they'd come up to another town. They'd come up to, uh, you know, uh, uh, Gibeon or, or someplace, or Lachish or something, and they'd say, this city's too strong, we can't take this city. Oh, no, no, remember the stones we set up? Remember the Lord of all the earth is going before us? Don't fear, have courage, God is with us, and he's powerful. He's powerful. God answered all the questions and the doubts should be removed. And God pr proved decisively that he would fight and win their battles. But here's where the real battle was being fought. It wasn't whether or not God, Yahweh, the Lord of all the earth, could hang with the gods of the Canaanites. Here's where the battle was fought. The true battle was in their minds and in their hearts. Would they remember? Would they remember God's presence and power? Or would their unbelief stand in the way of God's blessings that he had in store for them? God wanted to give them all the land. Remember Pastor Larry last week, he talked about the fact that God said, go around and everywhere where you place your foot, I'm going to give you that land. Well, it's not like they could just walk around, you know, uh, freely and go wherever they wanted. Wherever they went, they were going to be faced with enemies that stood in their way. So would they really believe and remember that God was powerful enough to overcome any challenge that they were about to face? Here's the point of the story for them. Here's the point of the story for us today. We must always remember that God's presence and his power can remove every barrier to his blessing. Always remember, never forget battle of the mind. It's a battle of the heart. Always remember that God's presence and power can remove every barrier to his blessing. Well, what was the blessing for the people? The blessing was for this land, this, this Canaan that they would get to possess. It, was, it represented peace, the shalom of God being in his protection, uh, having his prosperity. And then not only that, but it was, it was being then a witness to the whole world that the God of Israel is the Lord of all heaven and earth. Remember, they were coming from a place that represented death and burials and judgment because they saw an entire generation pass away. This was God's blessing. It was his promised shalom. It was like a restored Eden that God's people could be with him in his land and that he would bless them. What's the blessing that he's promised up? It, it's not too different, friends, although it's not a piece of dirt that you could touch. It's the same kind of peace and shalom and eternal life with God, not just in this world, but in, in a renewed world to come where moth cannot destroy and thieves can't break in and steal. We've got life. We've got a promised land that God has made access to for us. All the promises for then and the future and for now, for you today, God wants to bless you with peace in your heart. He wants to give you hope in your distress. He wants to offer you joy when you feel sorrow. He wants to give you comfort when you feel troubled. He offers forgiveness in the midst of your guilt. And when you feel shame and you feel dirty, he says, today I can give you a clean conscience. Amen. These are the promises that God has given to his people. He offered it to Israel. He offers it to humanity today. But there's a barrier. There's a barrier. You see, the barrier for, for the Israelites was the Jordan River. 
the flooded Jordan River, the great descender, the whitewater rapids of flooding. The east side contained memories of death. They'd buried an entire generation of Israelites there for 40 years in the wilderness, but the west side of Jordan represented the promised rest and new life that God intended for them. You see, they could see over to the other side and it was a glimpse of the new Eden that God had in store for his people. But they had to get over the barrier and God did it. The barrier was there. Well, what's the barriers for us? What are the barriers for you and for me? Remember, it's not a battle of can God do it? It's a matter of do I believe that God can do it? It's not a battle of whether or not God is good enough or can he or will he? It's a battle of the mind and a battle of the heart. So the kind of barriers that we face, friends, the kind of barriers we face are unbelief. Unbelief. I, I know God did it a long time ago, but I just don't see a way today. It's anxiety, fear. Our, our hearts are being tested even today. We've got a community that's in distress. I felt that I was sitting right there. I said, Mom, I don't know if I can get up and preach today. My heart is full of doubt and fear, and I had to offer it back to the Lord. 1 Peter 5 says, take those anxieties you have and cast them at him. Why? Because he cares for you. The battle's in our mind and in our heart. Maybe the battle for you today is just rebellion and disobedience. You've got a whole world of promise, a whole world of hope and peace for your heart, but you won't give up your sin. Remember what Joshua told the people before they went into the land, consecrate yourselves. Purify yourselves and get ready to take the promise. Maybe today there's a sin in your life that you've been harboring there's an idol that you've been bowing to in your mind and in your heart. And today's the day to remove the barrier and say, God, I want to cross over into your promise. You see, it's not about the barriers. It's about our God. Will we trust in him? That's the difference maker. That's the difference maker. Two things about God. He's the difference maker. First, it's his presence. God's presence presence with his people. You know, who were the first people that went into the Jordan? Remember, it was the priest carrying the ark, but it wasn't about the priests. It wasn't the man. It was God. God was showing by the ark going into the river first, I'm going ahead of you. Follow me. I'm with you. I'm not behind you. You don't have to work. God, are you there? Are you behind? No, no. I see you straight ahead. I'm following you. Is God in your front windshield, are you following him? Is he guiding you? He's the great initiator. In Deuteronomy 9, you know, a book ahead and years ahead, he tells Israel, you're now about to cross the Jordan to go in and dispossess nations greater and stronger than you with large cities that have walls built up to the sky. The people are strong and tall. They're Anakites. You know about them. You've heard it said, who can stand up to the Anakites? But be assured today that the Lord your God is the one who goes across ahead of you like a devouring fire. He will destroy them. He will subdue them before you and you will drive them out and annihilate them quickly as the Lord has promised you. Our God is the great initiator. Whatever trial or challenge you're going through today, be rest assured that if you're his child, he's already there waiting for you. You just got to follow him. The Lord is my shepherd and he, he leads me. Even though I walk through the valley, the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why? Because you're the initiator. You're with me. Your rod and your staff, they'll comfort me. Whatever challenge you're in today, friends, God is already there. He's leading you through the battles. The battle isn't there in front of you. What you can see and hear and feel, it's a battle here and it's a battle here. Will you trust in him, the great initiator? 
Well, the difference maker is God's presence and it's his power. He is our warrior. God said, I'm going to dispossess these peoples. I'm going to fight for you. And in Psalm 114, we have a celebration of what God did for his people, Israel. It says in Psalm 114, when Israel came out of Egypt, Jacob from a people of foreign tongue, Judah became God's sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea looked and fled, the Jordan turned back, the mountains leap like rams. The hills like lambs. Why is it, sea, that you fled? Why, Jordan, did you turn back? Why, mountains, did you leap like rams? You hills like lambs. Why? Why? Here's why. Tremble earth at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool, the hard rock into springs of water. It's a celebration of the power and the presence of God. He initiates, he goes before his people to fight their battles and he's powerful friends. He is a mighty, mighty warrior. We may be in new territory. Maybe you as an individual, maybe you've got a diagnosis. Maybe you've lost a job. Maybe your family is breaking apart. You're in new territory and it's terrifying you. Take heart today. Your God goes before you and he's powerful and he's the Lord of all the earth. Where's the battle today for you? Where's the battle today for this church? I've heard a lot of people wringing their hands. Oh man, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Well, there's going to be a new man that's going to be leading us, but we're going to have the same God. The same God that called and birthed this church into existence in 1971 is the same God that will be with us in 2019 and 2020 and beyond. So how do we respond? We get ready. We get ready. Have you prepared your heart to follow him? Are you still bowing down to the idols of this world? It's time for us to get ready to move. It's time for us to get ready to follow the initiator, our powerful God. Are, are you purifying yourself? Are you getting yourself ready? Are you following his lead? Remember, the priest had to get in before the water uh, stopped in a heap. It's time for us to just put our feet in the water. It's kind of like Peter, right? Remember Peter's there and he's in the boat and Jesus is out there walking on the water and Peter says, can I come out to you? And Jesus says, yeah, as long as you keep your eyes on me. It's time for us to get out of the boat, walk on the water. It may seem impossible, but with our God, all things are possible. What's God leading you today to do? Maybe it's to take a trip to Liberia. <laughs> We're going to celebrate seven people that are going to Liberia just this week and go preach good news. Maybe it's, though, not to go to Liberia. Maybe it's to go to the cubicle that you work next to and, and reach out to a coworker and share the love of Jesus Christ with them. Are we going to follow his lead? And then finally, are we going to remember? Are we going to wage the battle of our minds and our hearts to remember his power? Let me ask you a question. What are your stones of remembrance? What are the moments in your life, the things that God has brought you to or through that you remember? We're so easy to forget. I'll tell you, my family has some stones of remembrance. Over the last, uh, I'd say, six years, uh, we've been, we rent, and so we've had to move twice. And the first time we had 90 days to move, and the second time we had 60 days to move. And this was about a few years apart. And it was pretty unsettling for our family. Now, we had great landlords, and I think we were decent tenants, but we just had to move because they were going to sell their homes. And I remember Laura, and my wife Laura and I, we were talking, we were asking, do we bring this up to our kids? Now, they were a lot younger than they are now. And we thought, do we bring it up to them? And they said, well, it's the truth. They need to know. So we told them. And these were the questions they had. Where are we going to go? What's going to happen? Am I going to have my room? Are we going to have a backyard anymore? Do we have to move far away? Where are we going to? I'm all these questions. And the, que the answers were, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. And you could see the concern start to form on their faces. And their faces were reflecting what I was feeling in my heart and what Laura was feeling in our heart. But I'll tell you, we saw God's presence and power. We got on our knees and we prayed. We had moments of prayer in our living room on our knees saying, Lord, we're about to lose our home, but you are our refuge. You are our strength. We'll follow you through this because we believe in your power and your presence. Now, five-year-olds don't necessarily know how to pray like that, but we said, Lord, we trust in you. And God provided both times. God provided a place for us to live in. They were the unlikeliest of places. We didn't know we could live there. 
But God provided. And you know what? If you ask my kids today, hey, what are some things that God's done for you in your life? You know what? They look back at those stones. They say, I remember when we didn't know we were going to go. We called out to God and his power delivered us in the midst of a trying time. What are your stones of remembrance? What are your stones? What can you look back at and say, God has rescued me? Well, let me share with you one final thing and we're going to actually take part in a ceremony here to remember God's work. But think about this for a moment. If there's anything that we should look back at and recognize, this is God's demonstration of his mighty power. Isaiah 59 says, the strong arm of the Lord is not too short to save. You think about us, all of humanity, we live on the east side of the Jordan. We're born that way. We're born in sin and in death and in destruction. And we've got a great barrier like a Jordan River between us and the promised land of God's blessing. You know, when he created us, he didn't ever intend us to live in this broken world. He wanted us to have perfect fellowship with him. But that was broken by a barrier of our rebellion and sin and death. And it's, it's, it's unable to be crossed. We can't get over but we've got a great high priest. We've got a great high priest who's come and he says, I'm going to put my feet in the water. I'm going to come and I'm going to submerge myself yet while I'm without sin, but I'm going to take the full weight of all this barrier. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin on our behalf so that in him we could become the righteousness of God. Our great high priest enters into that barrier for us. And you know what happens? Once that high priest gets his feet in the water, the barrier is just dissolved and we could cross over into a promised land. This is the great decisive act of God's power, friends, for you and me. If you're here today and you think, I don't have any stones of remembrance, go back to that stone, the cornerstone, Jesus Christ, the one who stepped into the barrier for us so that we could cross over into newness of life. I want to ask you today, have you crossed over? Have you crossed over? There isn't any question that he can't answer. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life will you cross over today our high priest has dissolved the barrier so that we can cross over into the promised land you see the cross and the empty tomb are the greatest demonstration of God's power and Jesus on the night he was betrayed said I want you to always remember what I'm about to do for you and he took the bread and he passed the cup and we're going to do that right now Worship team, would you come up? We're going to sing a song. We're going to receive communion. And we're going to remember this stone of remembrance of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Let's prepare our hearts. Ushers, you could pass out the elements. Thank you.